I'm Byron Belitzos. Welcome to this 9-11 intensive in Corte Madera, California. And uh, today we have two very prominent experts on 9-11 and many other things, but we're focused on the 9-11 uh, scandal, which has become a pervasive, almost obsession for many Americans, millions of Americans, who are concerned about unanswered questions and concerned about the apparent whitewash of the 9-11 Commission report that just came out. And uh, today it's my honor to introduce our two speakers who will present a more advanced set of uh, information and concepts and philosophy and implications of 9-11. On my right is Jim Mars, who is uh, the author of many important books that have been on New York Times bestseller list, and most recently the book Inside Job, of which I'm the publisher. Inside Job is an encyclopedic summary of the key issues uh, of the unanswered questions surrounding 9-11 and much more. On my left is uh, Ken Jenkins, who's a veteran activist and videographer who's done uh, his own independent research into 9-11 over uh, from really three years now, this the third anniversary of his own research. Same with Jim, who started pretty much the same day on his research on 9-11. And uh, Ken will also give uh, elements of, of the presentation, uh, including um, some uh, video, I guess, and uh, PowerPoint uh, illustrations. So without further ado, I'm going to begin what I'd like to do today is uh, I'm start with Jim, then go to Ken, and then back to Jim. And um, then we'll have Q&A. invite you guys to do a lead-off statement, and then, uh, both of you, and then back to Jim for uh, uh, summation and uh, maybe a big picture. Uh, and then, uh, that, then from there, we'll head into uh, Q&A. How's that sound? Okay, I'm going to hand it off to Jim Mars. Do I need to take this mic or am I already no, you're mic'd? You're mic'd. I'm good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thanks, Byron. Um, yeah, there's just a couple of quick things. I really like the idea of the question and answer because this way we don't have to waste somebody's time who already knows the material and, and we can just get right to the issues that you are interested in. I would like to make a couple of three remarks, though. We've already previously been talking about, and I got on a tirade here, about the parallels between Nazi Germany and, and uh, the United States. And I got to tell you something, that going all the way back into the 60s, uh, Johnson and his administration, when the anti-war movement got started, were called fascist. And then it was Nixon and the Republicans, and they were called fascist. And then, of course, today you see a lot of these bumper stickers and stuff that says, says you know, uh, Bush is, is a fascist. But so I used to bridle at that term because I'm proud to be an American. And I was particularly proud all my life of America because I always had the idea that America never started wars, we only ended wars. But unfortunately today, we are starting wars. We now have a, a policy of preemptive war, which if you think this thing through is, is not only scary but dangerous. A preemptive war is the idea that we think that someone might attack us at some point in the future, so we're going to get the jump on them and we'll attack them right now. Now what happens if every country in the world was to take this philosophy? We'd have World War III tomorrow. This is extremely dangerous and furthermore it goes totally contrary to what we ourselves have established as international law. And in fact, it's really amazing to me that some of the things that are being advocated in our country today are the very things that we ruled against at Nuremberg, you know? They said, oh, well, it was the law. We said, sometimes you have to go above the law. You have to take it upon yourself to know what is morally correct. But I was only following orders. Sometimes you have to ignore orders or disobey orders if it flies in the face of common sense and common humanity. We established this precedent and now we're violating it right and left. Let me give you this definition. A form of government typically of the right that works in an alliance between the military and big business and is fueled by a ardent nationalism. Now what does that sound like? Sounds like the United States today, doesn't it? 
That is almost verbatim the American Dictionary definition of fascism. So when people say, you know, they're fascist, that's not just political rhetoric. That is actually, by dictionary definition, seems to be exactly where we're heading. And this is not the America that I was born into and the America that my uncles and my father fought for in World War II. And again, we, if we don't profit from history, we're doomed to repeat it. Now, there's a lot of talk about anti-Bush this, anti-Bush that. I know people in Texas who know Bush personally, and they all pretty much agree he's a hail fellow well met. What a great guy. And I venture to say from what I know about it that if all of us sat down, had a few beers, watched a football game with George W. Bush, we'd all come away and say, God, what a good old boy. Okay? Now, even though he doesn't know how to chew a pretzel. <laughs> So I can't personally get upset with George W. Bush. The thing you have to understand, though, is that he's a post-turtle. Everybody knows what a post-turtle is. Nope. When you, down in Texas, when you go down the little country road and you see a tortoise turtle up on a fence post, <laughs> okay, it's a post-turtle. Now, you know he doesn't belong there. You know he didn't get there by himself. You know somebody put him up to it. You know he can't accomplish anything while he's up there. And all you really want to do is help the poor creature down. <laughs> That's my opinion of George W. Bush. He's a post-turtle. But behind that post-turtle are some very evil people. And people who, they may be evil, but they're not stupid. They are shrewd, they are canny, and they are working an agenda. They are working an agenda that was articulated as far back as 1992 during the original Bush administration when Dick Cheney was the Secretary of Defense. And he issued a defense guidance policy paper which clearly laid out their plans. They wanted an invasion of Afghanistan. They wanted a regime change in, in uh, Iraq. They wanted a heavier military presence in the Middle East to control the oil resources of that region. And they wanted essentially a, uh, a military presence around the world and enforcement of American policies by military might. Now this very policy was echoed in September of 2000 by a neoconservative think tank called the Project for New American Century, composed of Cheney and Rumsfeld and Wolfowitz and Pearl and all of the dominant players in the Bush administration. They too call for this exact same agenda but they were a little bit more honest and they said this, this agenda could take a long time in coming unless there is a catastrophic and catalyzing event in the nature of another Pearl Harbor. Well, they got it on September the 11th, 2001. How convenient. And they have been pushing this agenda ever since. Now, once you take that fact that this is an articulated agenda that they've been pushing since at least the first Bush administration. And you couple that with the immense amount of knowledge and information which I've included in my book Inside Job of the foreknowledge of these attacks. And it's interesting that everybody keeps mentioning Pearl Harbor. They said another Pearl Harbor type attack. Right after 9-11, all the commentators were going, this is another Pearl Harbor. And you know, folks, that was really quite an apropos comparison but not for the reason most people think. Everybody says, yes, it's another dastardly sneak attack. No, what we now know and is pretty much historic fact is that Franklin D. Roosevelt and George Marshall and a handful of others in Washington, D.C. knew exactly when and where and how Pearl Harbor was gonna be attacked. And they allowed it to happen because it to further their own political agenda which was to get a united American population into World War II. Roosevelt had gotten elected on an unprecedented fourth term by pledging to keep us out of war. So he was in a politically untenable position. He had pledged a third term. He had pledged to get us out of war and keep us out of war, and yet he, at the insistence of his buddy Winston Churchill, knew we had to get in the war, and he knew we were gonna get in the war. 
and yet American was, America was largely isolationist. We didn't want to get in a war, okay? So how are they going to do that? They allowed us to be attacked. And actually it goes deeper than that because in the summer of 1941, Roosevelt cut off the Japan's oil supply and pretty much forced them to do something. They're an island nation, they got no resources. Uh, they either had two choices, dry up and blow away or go find some new oil resources, which they did in China. And we pointed to that and said, see, they're aggressors and, and they're terrible and, and we have to do something about that. And they knew that there was going to be a war between the United States and Japan and Japan opted for the preemptive strike our policy today. But we use that, of course, to say that we had been sneak attacked, da 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 da. I could go on and on about it. We could have a whole thing on that. So yes, this is tried and true policy. Now let me bring you up to a little bit up later though. Would Americans actually allow attacks on another Americans? Yes, unfortunately, they would. In the early 60s, following the disastrous Bay of Pigs invasion, Kennedy was so upset that the CIA had gotten so far out of control and was, had actually created their own Air Force and their own Army and their own training camps in Central and South America and had launched an invasion of another country, Cuba, in the spring of 1961, that he fired Alan Dulles as head of the CIA, Whit Bissell as, as a, a deputy director, and took the secret covert war against Castro and gave it to the Pentagon and said, if this is a military operation, then let's get the military people involved. Well, the best and the brightest in the Pentagon got to work and they came up with Operation North Woods. Operation North Woods, to put it simply, was a plan to set off bombs in American cities, principally Miami, Atlanta, to target people for assassination, to hijack airliners and to hijack ships on the high seas and to blame it on Castro to generate support for another invasion of Cuba. Never forget that this plan was approved by the Joint Chiefs of Staff. It was only President Kennedy that said, what the heck are you doing? You know, this is not what we're all about. And President Kennedy put the scotch on these plans and ordered these plans destroyed. But in a great stroke of irony, at least one set didn't get destroyed. It got buried in some government file somewhere, and guess how it got discovered? It got discovered in the early 90s thanks to the Assassination Records Review Board, which was created by Congress in the wake of the Oliver Stone movie. And they were given a mandate to be able to go into any government agency and dig out any records and files that may have had to do with the Kennedy era, and they discovered Northwoods. Now, does this sound like exactly what's happening now? Let me give you one other story that you've never heard about. I guarantee you this is true. In early 2002, in, in northern Florida, a very astute deputy sheriff, late one night, cruising along, sees a darkened pickup truck speeding along. So he stops him, pulls him over, goes up. The driver's all dressed in black. He's got a 45 and a shoulder holster. There's a shotgun, lots of ammunition in the back seat with bomb-making materials. Huh, well, needless to say, the guy arrested him. Then he gets to thinking, seems like I saw that pickup truck back at a Florida Power and Light utility station. So they get the crime scene guys out, he calls for backup, they take the guy back down there and they find where the tracks are at this power station. They find footprints leading to the uh, transmission station and they find an explosive device planted in the station there. The guy turns out to be a soldier from Fort Stewart, Georgia which is where we train our elite special forces troopers. His explanation, he was practicing his night maneuvers. <laughs> this story only appeared in the local newspapers, but somebody sent it to me via the internet. And I got very, very interested in this. And I called and talked to the reporter on the case, and this was maybe a week later, and I said, what's happened on this? And she said, well, you know, this is kind of unusual. I said. Uh, they keep postponing a hearing on this guy. They're still holding him, but uh, still hadn't even had a court hearing. So I start thinking, this to me is an either or situation. Either this guy is some nutball that managed to get in the army and was doing whatever craziness he was doing, in which case you would expect that there would be a huge public trial. They would throw the book at him in early 2002, just a few months after 9-11, to prove to everybody that we will not tolerate terroristic acts at this period of time. Or, he's acting on orders. This is part of a covert operation, and you'll never hear any more about this story. 
Have you all ever heard anything more about this story? Yeah. Never heard a word, have you? Yeah. Okay. False sponsorship. Oldest game in the book. Operation North Woods. Now, so that brings us to the actual Al-Qaeda network, you know. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself, and I'm getting into too much detail. The, the whole thing's a sham. It's just a sham. But I will show you a very interesting thing that happened. This is a true story happened to me at the airport on the way out here. Well, it was created by the CIA. We all know that. But the, except for the 9-11 Commission. They don't seem to know that. <laughs> <laughs> they gave us several pages about how that Al-Qaeda was created in the wake of the resistance to the Soviets in Afghanistan, which is true enough, but not one word about the support, training, and arms that the CIA gave to them. And this is pretty astounding. And of course, as you all know from the spy movies, if a guy says, well, I used to be with the CIA, but not anymore, what's the next line? Hey, nobody retires from the CIA. So, you know, how do we know that Al-Qaeda is not still working for the CIA. That's a, a, a smoking gun right there. Key smoking gun, I brought this up yesterday so I'll cut it real short, but there's some of you who hadn't heard this. One of the top Al-Qaeda chiefs that has been called is a fellow named Abu Zabidah. He was arrested in Pakistan in, in mid-2002. Through some ingenious interrogation, they tricked him, basically, and he Ari Flasher, who was then the uh, White House press secretary, was uh, really, really big about this capture, made a big deal out of it, and says, by golly, we're going to make this guy talk. Well, they did. And guess what he revealed? He's actually working for the Saudis. He named three Saudi princes and gave their private unlisted telephone numbers, which checked out. What's really interesting is, is that within about a month, all three of the Saudi princes he named were dead two in car crashes and one a young Saudi prince who was about in his early 30s, 31, 32, I think. They said he died, died of dehydration. Now, you know, I have a problem trying to understand how an Arab dies of dehydration. I mean, aren't they born into an environment where they better learn how to take care of themselves and make sure they got some water? But anyway, so that tells me this is all very true. So therefore, if, if, if this is true and those are facts, then Al-Qaeda is still being run by the Saudis. The 9-11 Commission pretty well made this clear. They dispelled one myth, which was that Al-Qaeda has been financed through uh, Osama bin Laden's personal fortune. They said that's not true. It, they said it's been financed through a series of Saudi charities. Okay, Senator Bob Graham of Florida went even further. He said these are not rogue agents. All of them have been in touch with ranking members of the Saudi government. Okay. So in other words, if there is a state sponsor behind the 9-11 attacks, which, there, which in the days following the mass mean media made a big deal, they said nothing of this magnitude could have been carried out without state sponsorship. And that's in fact the foundation for our argument for launching an attack against Afghanistan and then later Iraq. Even though President Bush now himself has admitted that there's no connection between Saddam Hussein and 9-11. Are any of you all still under the impression that Saddam Hussein had anything to do with 9-11? No. So why are we over there? But what I love is what we do know was that most of those terrorists of 9-11 had belonged to terrorist cells operating out of Hamburg, Germany. So why don't we go bomb Germany? We've had lots of practice at that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, the whole thing's insane. And then we have to go after weapons of mass destruction, which non-existent. And it's not like we didn't know. Hans Blix, the United Nations weapons inspector, told us repeatedly, they don't have any weapons of mass destruction. Our own weapons inspector, Scott Ritter, said they don't have any weapons of mass destruction, and the United Nations Atomic Energy Agency said they don't have any weapons of mass destruction. And if you'll also think back, and I have to keep prompting people to think back because I finally figured out that the attention span of the average American is about 15 minutes. If it happened past 15 minutes ago, we've forgotten about it. You know, and we're all conditioned that way because on television, you watch that murder mystery in an hour, it's cleaned up. You know, we know who the killer is and he's already brought to justice and or thrown off a roof or whatever. It's all taken care of. But in real life, it doesn't take that way. Sometimes it takes more time. Okay, so you have to go back and look at all this. If you'll think back, you'll realize that right before the invasion of Iraq, Saddam Hussein says, okay, okay, send in weapons inspectors, do whatever you want, you know, whatever you demand, fine, I'll do it. But we had to go in anyway. 
George Bush says, I'm not taking yes for an answer. <laughs> We're going to go do it. Okay? We got to go in there. Why is that? We got a whole little program here. Unfortunately, we don't have time to do this right now, but it might, it might give you some idea of why we had to go into Iraq. Okay? It has to, one of the, one of the objectives was to eliminate the evidence of our species heritage. It all started in Mesopotamia. And now we are continuing to bomb and destroy some of our most precious historical and heritage artifacts and, and buildings. They don't want us to know where we came from because then we might not listen to them. So that's basically where we are. I'm going to close by simply explaining to you why there's such a small group here and such a large group out there. It continually amazes me. Of course, I've realized for many, many years that I'm on a search for truth, and I want to know what's going on, and I don't care if it's good, bad, or indifferent. I want to know the truth. When you're going through the forest and you hear a rustling in the bushes, you get fearful because you don't know what it is. Franklin Roosevelt said, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. And that's exactly where fear comes from is the unknown. You don't know what it is. You don't know what it's going to mean. And so you get fearful. Now, if a bear comes out of the bushes and starts coming at you, you're not, you're not near as afraid as you were. Because now at least you know what the danger is and you know that you can take some action. You can go climb a tree. You can run off. You can get your gun, whatever. So you don't get too fearful about situations where you know what the situation is. Because if you have any sense of worth, you, you know that you'll handle that situation. It's the fear of fear. That's what it is. And that's what they're playing on us right now. And that's what Ken's been talking about. Fear versus love. Light versus dark. Which, by the way, truly translates and has been understood throughout history to translate into ignorance versus knowledge. If you know what's going on, no matter how horrendous it is, at least then you can deal with it. But if you're ignorant, then you're fearful because you don't, it's, it's the fear of the unknown. You don't know. So let me explain quick, and then I'll sit down. All these people, why aren't they at these meetings? Why weren't they there yesterday? Why aren't they pushing the media to tell us the truth? What's wrong with people out there? Are they asleep? Do they not really care? No, no. They're in deep, deep denial, and they're shut down, and I'll explain to you why. Once a person knows not just suspects. Once a person knows that the government under which they live is criminal and immoral, possibly even illegal, it puts them between a rock and a hard place because they understand that if they stand up and try to take action against that government, that they're putting their job, their pension, their family, their friends, perhaps even their life at risk. And that's tough. But then they also know on a deep, deep subconscious level that if they don't stand up and do something, then they put at risk their self-image as someone who stands for principle. And that's a tough, tough position to be in. And just like your computer is like your brain, what happens when you give your computer conflicting commands? It locks up and it shuts down. And folks, that's where they are. It's not that they don't care. It's not that they, some of them don't, it's not that they don't know. It's that they're shut down and locked up, they're frozen, and they need a reboot. <laughs> That's right. What you gotta do, what you gotta do is treat them with gentleness, kindness, and love, and say, look at here, look at here, how could this happen? This can't happen. Or let me tell you the wildest conspiracy theory I've ever heard. Nineteen hijackers who don't even know how to drive cars hijack four airliners simultaneously, do all kinds of intricate maneuvers, fly them into these buildings and crash them all on the orders of a cleric in a cave in Afghanistan. And all against the systematic shutdown and failure of a $40 billion defense system that's been in place <laughs> since World War II. Now, how's that for a crazy conspiracy theory? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, pleasure to be sharing the stage with you today.
Uh, I'm Ken Jenkins, and I, I've been doing 9-11 presentations now for about two and a half years. Uh, the first one was right here in this room, so this is uh, coming back home time. And uh, the presentations I've been doing uh, generally last about three hours, and it's about half video, which is uh, available on the DVD that I've produced, uh, Perspectives on 9-11. And then the other half I do with PowerPoint. And so um, I want to start by uh, bouncing off a couple things that Jim said that I agree with. Um, uh, let's start with uh, the F word, fascism. Um, I have, have had my own resistance to using that word, uh, but for a slightly different reason, which is that it's just such a loaded word. If you talk to, uh, if you talk to Americans about uh, fascism, there's this immediate rejection that, uh, you know, we're not that, that's what we fight against. Uh, and what I ran across was a study done a few years ago by a professor, and I'm sorry I don't have the slide up right now, but uh, that basically uh, analyzed the five major recent fascist uh, states, Hitler and Mussolini and all those, and found 14 characteristics that those, uh, those states had in common. And uh, if you look at that list of 14 characteristics, the United States right now hits 12 of them dead center. So we're already in a fascist state. And I'll just give one of the list. Of, and the other two, by the way, we hit at glancing blows. So we really have all 14, but we have 12 of them pretty much dead center. So it's not a question of are we heading into a fascist state. It's how far are we going to go, how much deeper are we going to go. And the one uh, of the 14, the one that stands out for me because I uh, work in media and I have a lot of interest in media, is our media and what's happening with our media and why stories uh, don't get into the media. And the bottom line is that our media is highly controlled and it's controlled amongst other things by the CIA and that there are people in, in high places of power, according to William Car Colby, Colby, the ex-director of the CIA, um, that are, act as the gatekeepers and keep the stories um, that, are, that journalists are trying to tell from being told. Um, you go to the Project Censored website, get their books, get their information, and you find all kinds of stories um, that are of major importance that aren't being told. Um, similarly, a book called Into the Buzzsaw outlines 18 significant, important stories uh, in recent years uh, that have gotten, uh, have not been told in the major media. And despite the fact that the journalists basically risked their careers and in some places lost their careers uh, as a result of trying to get these stories out. Gary Webb's uh, story about uh, cocaine being brought into the country or the CIA and so forth was one uh, that was in the San Jose Mercury and then got squashed. Greg Pallas' work on the 2000 election and the disenfranchisement of the voters is another example. And uh, the point is that our media is totally and completely controlled in, in, in terms of the major media, um, but not the minor media. You know, we can't get things on major broadcast TV, but we can make DVDs. Uh, we can't get things uh, in major newspapers, but we can write books. And so part of our challenge is to figure out what are the medias that we can use and use them to the maximum because uh, the major ones are not currently available to us. And that is a form of fascism. And it's part of why things like 9-11 can be done and the people that do them can know that they can get away with it because they know they have the media controlled. And I, I was most aware of the media control uh, getting to the point that it's gotten uh, in the first Gulf War. Uh, if you think back to the TV uh, coverage of the first Gulf War, it was totally sanitized. It was a video game is what got onto our media. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons that many people feel that, we, that the Vietnam War finally ended was because the citizens of the U.S. saw war carnage on TV in the nightly news every night, and they just finally got sick of it. And yeah, there was the 58,000 deaths, and there were a lot of other factors. There were the protests that got bigger and bigger. But of all the factors, uh, the, the nightly news may have been one of the, the biggest ones. And uh, we don't have that anymore. You know, we don't even get the coffins c coming home. We certainly don't get um, any, any real war carnage or any of the reality of the war that we're doing. And we certainly don't know the suffering that's going on in, in Pakistan, uh, and, well, all over in, uh, I was starting to say Iraq, but, uh, but in Palestine, for that matter, this has been going on for so many years. So the point is, we already have a fascist state, and what are we going to do about it? And so uh, 
currently we have the 9-11 issue that we're working with and we have uh, an election coming up and there's a lot of uh, energy about uh, you know if we get four more years of George Bush that's uh, we're, we're toast and um, what I would suggest is that as we are out there in the world and, and trying to make a difference with this uh, with any of these issues that if we're coming from a personal place um, that is a, coming from positive motivations that we're going to be more effective and so when I spoke uh, at the San Francisco inquiry last uh, here in San Francisco last March and in Toronto last May the topic that I chose was psychological aspects and I did that for a number of reasons one being that nobody else was um, at least as a, as a whole topic um, Jim just spoke to it a bit and um, also because I have uh, education in that area and finally because uh, everybody else was covering the basic information rather well and I didn't need to do that so um, part of that talk was talking about psyops psychological operations and, and what's the nature of those are uh, because that's basically what 9-11 was was a psyop it was designed as mind control to get people behind this war on terror which is uh, the perpetual war to replace the Cold War and uh, so I talked about that and the, um, the challenges that uh, we face as, as, uh, as reform, reformers and that's what this slide speaks to is uh, that in order to change uh, the world we also need to look to change ourselves. And basically what I've found is that Excuse a lot of... Me, they're not projecting up there. Oh, sorry. Thank you. There we go. Okay, so working on to change the world without also doing the inner work of changing and healing ourselves and our own and our personal relationships is far less effective and efficient. Um, for instance, we see in the 9-11 movement that there's uh, many personalities that are not totally fully functional and that we there's a lot of inner fighting and, and uh, contention within the movement because people haven't done their own homework. They haven't uh, dealt with their own issues enough and so they're bringing their kind of baggage into, into the movement which is, of course, inevitable and part of what life is about. But what I'm suggesting is that, uh, that we can do more uh, in the world if, we, if we're coming from uh, a place where our own, our own personal issues aren't getting in the way so much. And the thing that I've noticed particularly uh, is that people um, definitely feel a sense of urgency today, and what's often under that is a sense of panic. And it turns out panic and urgency superficially look similar, and, and, uh, and yet... Uh, they're actually very different emotions, so I want to talk briefly about that too, so you can differentiate the difference between urgency and panic in your own self. So we feel a sense of urgency about the 9-11 issue and also particularly right now about the election. And what many of us feel is a healthy sense of urgency is very often a very different and less comfortable emotion, which is known as panic. And as superficially, they, they seem similar. So how do we know which is which? Well, I've made this list of uh, what I think are uh, characteristics of the two emotions and how they differ and panic is basically based on fear and urgency is based on a sense of concern which is based on love and so it comes down to that basic dichotomy between fear and love and if you look at this list uh, and if you look within yourself and you think about for instance the upcoming election and uh, the ecological uh, crisis that we face and the various other crises that we face in the world and you look at your own internal feelings, I think you'll find virtually all of these on both sides of the column uh, are present at one time or another for all of us. And what I would suggest is that if we can look at the left-hand list of panic and, and the various things that come up there and realize, okay, this is part of what's motivating me right now. I'm, I'm actually uh, at times coming from a sense of panic rather than just healthy sense of urgency. And if we can clear that out within ourselves and, and reduce that sense of panic, and, and, and work to increase uh, and the healthy sense of urgency that can allow us to operate in a, in a very uh, efficient way and actually have fun doing what we're doing and not feel like we're operating from some sort of a desperation of, well, this has to happen or else, but rather, well, this is something I would like to happen. This is something I'd prefer to happen. And uh, it, it just seems like it would be the, the, the best way to go. And so I'm going to work just as hard and just as diligently but be just because I would prefer this to happen, not because I feel like if it doesn't happen, we're in deep, deep trouble. And uh, that, of course, in implies a certain sense of, uh, of confidence and um, belief in your fellow 
mankind, womankind, in, in, in humanity, that we can handle these situations and that this isn't going to uh, result in some sort of uh, disaster or Armageddon. And uh, I think the Armageddon uh, idea that is very common within this country as part of my longer presentations is talking about um, where and how this Armageddon idea is, is there and, and how common it is in this country. Um, a very significant percentage of, uh, of the United States actually believes in the absolute inevitability of Armageddon. And with that kind of energy out there, all of us are going to feel um, a certain sense of either urgency or panic or some combination. And um, I think uh, if we can get past the idea that uh, if we don't do something in some very short time, that we're going to hit some kind of a catastrophic turning point and it's going to be too late, if we can get past that in our, our the own Armageddon within, within each of us, that we can get out of this state of panic and get uh, back in more of a, a state of healthy urgency. And a lot of that comes down to our own personal uh, personality factors. And this is something I, I've also talked about at other times is what personalities uh, have what kind of outlooks and, and what drives us to feel the way we feel and to be motivated the way we are. We don't have time to go into that today, but uh, it's just another way of working on ourselves and, and uh, and getting out of this, this sense of uh, a panic and, and more into a sense of healthy urgency so that we can actually have fun making these differences and making these changes. Now for myself, uh, I'm, I'm motivated to do this 9-11 work primarily by the fact that I feel that 9-11 has uh, an immense amount of leverage to make very profound change and that uh, that leverage uh, will serve to wake people up in a way that almost no other issue can. And at the same time, I'm also aware that because 9-11 is such a huge issue and, is, and uh, has so much resistance that uh, it's, it's going to take a while. You know, it's now been three years. We've made a huge amount of progress and we've got a long way to go. And, you know, it could take another three years or more before this issue is fully broken. That doesn't mean that we don't continue to work uh, diligently and it doesn't mean that we can't use this issue perhaps to affect the election because the more people know about it, the more it's going to turn people around and wake people up. But to think that, uh, that we can somehow break it out overnight, given that uh, the nature of our, our major media, I think, personally, I think is a little unrealistic. But we've gained a huge amount of momentum. We've got some incredible resources we're working with, and uh, we're making some great progress. So uh, before I close here, I want to speak briefly about the 9-11 issue as uh, how it kind of fits in uh, with things. That um, this issue is a, uh, an issue where when people do study the information, they tend to uh, realize that uh, the official story doesn't make sense. And uh, what's encouraging is it's a one-way change, that people that uh, realize that 9-11 uh, was an inside job, at least to some degree, um, they, they don't go back. They don't go back to the official story. So it's, uh, it's encouraging in that way. And uh, it's also interesting a number of people knew instantly uh, that 9-11 happened. So the other main topic that I've talked about uh, at the two international inquiries were the psychological challenges exposing the truth to more people, which Jim just spoke about rather well. I'm going to add that to my presentation. Um, the, he was speaking about the denial and uh, the implications of if you believe this, then what? And the implications, he's quite right, are huge. Um, what I would want to specifically talk about is that people don't want to believe it. And these are a couple actual quotes from people when presented with the information about 9-11. One saying, well, it may be true, but I don't believe it. <laughs> and the other one saying, well, I wouldn't believe that even if it were true. And this, these are amazing statements when you think about it, that uh, people's uh, beliefs override the truth when it's put in their face. But what we have to realize is that the beliefs are the foundations of reality. And that if you change a belief, it changes your reality. And we live in a, in a country and in a world that where we are under the impression that a government its job, one of its jobs, is to protect us. And so we have these, we spend literally trillions of dollars on defense uh, and, and for our own security. 
and to find out that our own government is responsible for something like 9-11, it's just too big. So one of the biggest psychological challenges to getting 9-11 truth out is that many people have a number of reasons and defenses for not wanting to believe. To, ac to accept that our government that is supposed to protect us will kill us greatly reduces a sense of security. It is scary, even terrifying. They don't want to go there. They don't want to think about it or hear about it. And knowing that, it's up to us to uh, respond with, with empathy and understanding and realize, you know, look, this is, this is a scary thing. And what's scary about it is if the government is, rather than protecting us, is actually our biggest enemy in certain ways, um, where's our safety? You know, where do we get our new sense of security and safety if we take that sense of security and safety away? That's a big question and, and, and something that would take a long time to, uh, to go into now. And another thing to be realizing as we're trying to uh, put this information out is uh, this, this quote, all truth passes through three stages. First it is ridiculed, second it is violently opposed, and third it is accepted as self-evident. And it's the ridicule and violent opposition that I, I want to address here is that the ridicule often comes in the sense of, well, that's just a, con a conspiracy theory which means you're a conspiracy nut. Um, and there's various ways that they will discredit this information because they don't want to believe it. And uh, fortunately, we have the truth on our side and we have a huge amount of evidence so we can work through that one. The violently opposed is basically the hostility that uh, is sort of the kill the messenger idea is that because this information, this kind of information is threatening to people, if you are presented, you become part of the problem. And therefore, people will literally become hostile towards you and be angry towards you to even try to talk about this stuff. And uh, it's just good to know that because these kinds of things come up. And finally, the, the, the area in addition to what Jim spoke to so well, the resistance that we face, uh, is the same re, uh, situation that got us into where we are today. You know, how did we get here? Why, are, why did things become the way they are? is partly because uh, apathy and complacency is epidemic in this country, and it has been uh, for a long time. And the good news is that's changing, and that people are becoming more involved and more uh, uh, active politically and in other ways than, than ever. And in that sense, uh, as I said earlier, Bush has kind of done us all a big favor, because many of the problems, in fact, virtually all the problems that we face and that are becoming more and more crisis have been going on for decades. There's, there's not that much new, and, and uh, as Jim was saying earlier, 9-11 isn't really new. It's business as usual. This is how wars are started. We know that now, for instance, about the Iraq war. It was all based on lies. So these things have been going on for a long time, uh, so it's actually good that they've gotten to the crisis point. Where the One metaphor is that it's sort of like an alcoholic hitting bottom, is that things have to get really bad before some people will be shaken out of their apathy, their complacency, their denial, or whatever their resistance is, and be willing to make changes. And uh, we're at that point now. You know, it's gotten that bad, and people are waking up. And um, so in a sense, Bush has done us a favor. And um, you know, the biggest challenge we will face if Kerry is elected is that people will want to go back to sleep. They'll say, oh, great, everything's fine now. Um, you know, we got, uh, we got good to that terrible Bush guy, and now we can all go back to sleep and, and uh, just watch TV or whatever. And so um, as we work to, to get rid of Bush and get Kerry, uh, bear that in mind that our biggest challenges are once we get rid of Bush, uh, as keeping people awake and, and continuing to wake people up. And 9-11, to me, is the biggest wake-up call that we have, and that's why I'm doing this work. So I think we're going to go um, next into Q&A. Uh, this is an intensive, and uh, most of you know the basics. And what we want to do is find out what you want to know and what you'd like to talk about, and um, we'll go from there. And so um, I don't know if we want to do just a simple Q&A. or. going to actually do a little summary first. Okay. We're going to take a little round up and then, then take a break. And okay, and then we'll go into to Q&A. Great. Thanks again. Yay. Oh, I'm doing the yeah. round. <laughs> 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 Let me say this about that. <laughs> um, 
I think the summary is on 9-11 is that, uh, well, I'll give, you, I'll give you one more tidbit of information that I really stressed in my talk, but I think, again, this is another smoking gun. And it has to do with the war game exercises. This has been very little talked about, barely covered by the 9-11 Commission, and yet it's firmly on the record. We know that the National Reconnaissance Office on the morning of September the 11th, 2001, was conducting a, an, an exercise at their building there in Virginia. And they evacuated 3,000 people, and their scenario was that a plane had crashed into the building. Well, now, number one, that puts a total lie to the repeated statements of Condoleezza Rice and Cheney and Bush, who continually said, well, who would have ever thought that they would crash buildings in the uh, planes into buildings. Well, they were practicing that that very morning. Plus, we know that uh, in the mid 90s, they had uncovered in the Philippines a plane, a plan for uh, Operation Bojinka, which was an Al Qaeda cell that had plans in their computers for hijacking airliners and flying them into buildings. These warnings were passed along to the United States government. We also know that as early as 2000, planners, war game planners within the Pentagon had uh, advocated a scenario of hijackers hijacking airplanes and crashing them into buildings. These design designs were uh, denied because they said, oh, that's too far out. But top brass knew that that was a very real plan. But I think the thing that really gets me is, is that Chris Carter, the uh, the uh, originator of the X-Files series, yeah. there was a spinoff called The Lone Gunman. And in March of 2001, they actually aired a Lone Gunman uh, episode. It was, the pilot episode. It, it was the pilot episode. And they had, and what was really interesting is, it was government agents posing as terrorists, hijacked airliners, and uh, had them crash into the World Trade Center. So if Chris Carter can figure this out, our $40 billion worth of intelligence and counterterrorism money that was spent at that same period of time, they couldn't figure it out. But the key thing, again, is the war game exercises, Vigilant Guardian. This is why when uh, Richard Clark, who was then the counterterrorism chief, quickly picked up the telephone, got hold of General Myers, who was in charge of NORAD, and said, have you launched any interceptors? His first response was, is this real or is this part of the war game? Now, actually this is a defense for the Bush administration and for the authorities at that time and for that morning as to why there was such a conspicuous lack of immediate response to these hijackings. And even after the first plane crashed into the World Trade Center, there was confusion. Is this real or is the war game exercise? So why haven't they let us know that? Why haven't they, and if they're embarrassed to say, well, gee, we were practicing the very thing, but uh, we were confused, then at least they could have leaked this information uh, to blunt the criticism of their lack of immediate response. But they haven't even done that. Why? Because once you understand that the confusion, the success of 9-11 was due to these war game exercises, the next question is, how did the hijackers know when to coordinate their attack? This, my friends, is the proof, the smoking gun, that this was an inside job. So that's where we are on that. Um, questions for Ken and myself? We'll just, we'll just start up here and move back. Yes. Um, I really liked your sort of uh, bottom up um, working to show the connections uh, to show the connections between all these seemingly desperate uh, pieces um, leading to the top yes and um, you got near to the pinnacle for me and what I wanted you to talk about a little bit was the connections between um, the Bushes and the bin Ladens I know that um, Larry Clayman when Robert Wright was coming out to, to the FBI agent to talk about what he knew or Siebel Edmonds, or all these people who they're running around talking about national security on and shutting them up. Um, Larry Klayman came out and said, the Bush's vacation with the Bin Ladens. Um, oh, it goes stronger than that. 
that was what he said. That's all I could say. So I, I think that the climax of that pinnacle, when you go, when you get the Saudis all connected up with Al Qaeda, you get Al Qaeda all connected up with the CIA. Now come in with the Bushes connected to uh, the Bin Ladens, and that's a really nice package that's of time the, that connected. That's the, the connection. Terrorism, drugs, the Saudis, mm -hmm. the Saudi charities, oil, the Bushes. It's all one big ball. Back in the 70s, George W. Bush got his start in the oil business with a little company in Houston called Arbusto Energy. It's really pretty funny because I think somebody told him Arbusto in Spanish means a bush. Actually, it means shrub. <laughs> it's a little, little bush. I don't know. Maybe they knew that. Maybe they didn't. Who put up the money that got George into Arbusto Energy? Bin Laden. Salim Bin Laden. Osama bin Laden's older brother, who then had extensive holdings in South Texas, including an airport and a lot of property. This is according to business records and records in the Austin American Statesman. I even talked to the reporter who had covered all that, and his only question was, how come this information hasn't gotten wider coverage, which is an excellent question. And of course, the answer to that quite simply is the control, the total control over the media. And I'll briefly say this about control of the media. If you go talk to your local reporter, your local editor, your local radio commentator, local uh, news producer for your local television station, they're going to laugh up their sleeve at you and you're going to say, there's no control over the media, nobody controls me. And essentially, that's true. They cannot and they do not control every editor, every reporter across the country but they definitely and tightly control the distribution of the information. And if you don't hear about it, it didn't happen, did it? And my point here is, is that I don't care how smart you are. Some of you people sitting right there are probably a lot smarter than I am. But if you're acting on faulty or incomplete or erroneous information, I don't care how smart you are, you cannot make a correct decision. And that's how that works. So yes, the connection in the year 2000, the Bush family were flown to Saudi Arabia as guests of the Saudis in general and the Bin Ladens in particular. The Bin Ladens had a huge investment in the Carlisle Investment Group, which of course is the Bushes, Henry Kissinger, etc. This is why you might recall, think back, think, when Bush, after dragging his feet for two years, on a 9-11 investigation was finally forced mostly by the families of 9-11 victims and by a slight groundswell of public opinion into forming some sort of investigation. And this is pretty incredible because at Pearl Harbor the next day Congress was forming a commission to study what happened. Kennedy assassination, less than a week later Johnson formed the Warren Commission. Of course it was a whitewash but at least they went through the motions. They they had an investigation. Two years after 9-11, we still did not have an investigation into what, what really happened. And when he finally was forced into naming a commission, who did he name to head it? Kissinger. Henry Kissinger. Holy cow. Now, everybody understands, and every ball of commentators have pointed out, that 9-11 was an attack upon our freedom, our democracy, okay, because of people who were upset with our foreign policy. Well, who led that foreign policy for 30 years? Kissinger. Henry Kissinger. So that's like putting the fox in charge of the hen house. It was absolutely an affront to the American people. He might as well just got on national television and gave us the bird, okay? <laughs> and it was so obvious and raised such a stink that Kissinger quickly bowed out. His official reason was because he didn't realize he was going to have to reveal his client list of Kissinger and Associates. And that's some of that is probably partially true because it would have revealed that he is very close and has been working with the Saudis and uh, a lot of these, Pakistan, Iraq, all the rest of them. Saddam Hussein undoubtedly was a ten-horned, two-bit dictator, but he was our ten-horned, two-bit dictator. He fought an eight-year war with Iran, who was our enemy du jour, okay, back during the 80s, and uh, at our behest. And we armed him, we gave him all the parts, the ammunition, everything else. He, he, the biggest thing that they accused Saddam Hussein of was gassing the Kurds. Well, where'd he get the gas? We sold it to him. You know, 
What it all boils down to, in the words of that great philosopher, Pogo, we've met the enemy and he is us. In fact, when you go back, here's the thing I really don't understand. If people would go back and do their homework, they would find that Prescott Bush was prosecuted under the Trading with the Enemies Act in late 1942 as being nothing but a financial front man for Hitler and the Nazis. I notice a nod back there. Do you know why that was not really publicized very much? Because in the summer of 1942, when Prescott undoubtedly knew he was under investigation and knew that this was going to start cracking open, what, what does he do? He, he formed the USO. He created the United Service Organization, which if any of you all have ever been in the military, you love the USO because that's where you go for coffee and donuts and a little taste of home when you're off somewhere at some army base. Now, how could they publicize the prosecution of the guy that formed the USO in the middle of World War II as being a Nazi sympathizer? Well, they can't. That would have harmed the war effort, so they fined him a few million, slapped his wrist, and all that kind of got swept under the rug. Let me finish my thought. Now, you got a question. So Prescott supported Hitler and the Nazis. George Herbert Walker Bush, both as director of the CIA and as vice president under Reagan, after he got shot and he was acting pretty much as the leader, Reagan was out of it even before he got Alzheimer's. Who created Saddam Hussein? George Herbert Walker Bush. Who got funded and uh, into the oil business by the Bin Ladens? George W. Bush. You would think that the Americans would kind of go, gee, why do we keep electing these guys who have supported our worst enemies? But they don't, they don't seem to think about that. You know, well, he got selected. <laughs> and that's another thing. Another thing, you know, uh, it was said earlier that uh, this next election might get thrown into the courts. Could this be why that uh, Bush already now on three separate occasions has gone around Congress, around the Senate confirmation hearings process and appointed his own judges in opposition to the Constitution. It's absolutely incredible. But see, what you don't know can hurt you. And that's something that we need to press upon our fellow citizens. A lot of people think, oh, well, I don't need to know that. And, well, those people in Washington will take care of that, or, well, my elected representative. No. But they don't even know. They don't even know. Patriot Act and Homeland Security, both, were rushed through a panicky Congress who never even got a chance to read the laws. And were threatened. And were threatened. Now, I ask you, and some of you, I'm sure, have had an experience with a lawyer. You go to a lawyer about a legal question, and one of the first pieces of advice your lawyer gives you is never sign anything until you read it and understand it. But your elected representatives rush through all of this Constitution shredding legislation, and they never even got a chance to read it. You had a question? Yeah, Prescott Bush and the Nazis, he financed the steel industry for them. There's some mention about the SS guys being imported over to advise the Bushes. Can you, can you oh, absolutely. About that? See, there, this is one of my, yeah, all guys. right, briefly, I'll just give you the overview. You can just take it or leave it. I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. I'm not trying to say I know everything, but I'm trying to point some things out that, to give you some areas to go check into, okay? One of the biggest untold stories of the 20th century is that, yes, we defeated the Germans in World War II, but we didn't defeat the Nazis. They took the loot of Europe, and they, we f only forced them to move. And where'd they come? They came over here under Operation Paperclip. They flooded this country. We put them into our CIA. rocket program, into the CIA, into our intelligence things. Galen, General Galen, Army Groups East, okay? He was the premier Nazi intelligence chief in charge of Russia during the war. And he had an easy time of it because he was able to go in there and as the German armies moved through Russia, he picked up all the anti-communists that were still around, okay, and they flocked to him. So he had this extensive network, underground network already in place in Russia that, was get, that were anti-communist to begin with, feeding him information. And at the end of the war, according to his own autobiography, he had crates and crates and crates of information and he went and turned himself into the Western authorities, notably the Americans, and he said, look, 
you're now going to be facing the Russians, the Soviets. They've had 20 years to infiltrate agents into your country, and you don't know squat about Russia, but I've got all the information. And he said, I will provide all this information to you now, all this intelligence, under a few conditions. One is, he said, I would never be, I will never be asked to do anything that would be against the best interests of my fatherland, Germany, which shows he's an unreconstructed Nazi, okay? And he said, and then uh, later when West Germany uh, becomes independent and has its own intelligence network, I want to be head of it. And this was all done. So no wonder we had a Cold War right off the bat because every bit of intelligence we were getting about the Soviets was coming from an anti-communist underground filtered through a Nazi organization. <laughs> no wonder, no wonder we immediately went into a Cold War. And yet if you go back and look at it objectively, what you find is, is that the Russians at the end of World War II were scared to death. They were ringed by American troops. There were American troops in Japan, American troops in China, American troops in Burma and India, American troops in the Middle East, American troops in Europe, and we had the bomb. And they didn't. There's so what? Evidence that the SS collaborates now and helps to run because the they all came over here and just immediately became part of our national security apparatus. Who was the highest decorated Nazi of them all? Werner von Braun, the founder of NASA, our space program. Okay, and uh, his uh, lieutenant was General Walter Dornberger, Luftwaffe chief who was in charge of concentration camp Dora, where they use these concentration camp victims as free labor to build Pinamunda and all of these facilities, should have been tried for war crimes, and instead he became chief of security for Bell Helicopter. Okay? And, I'm, and it just goes on and on and on. We know, we know this stuff. What we don't know is, is that some of the Nazi scientists, the psychologists, psychiatrists, people working on mind control, the people that were doing those horrendous experiments, in the concentration camps were brought over here and rolled into our old OSS and then into the CIA, and they were the genesis of our MKUltra artichoke programs, which is mind control. This doesn't get talked about. I only know of two or three really decent books on the whole subject, but they are the ones who did the groundwork about how to control masses of people. I was just talking about this with the gentleman back here. When you go in the military, what they do is they tear you down as an individual. They shave your head, beard, shave off all your hair, they put you in a uniform so you're just like the next guy. And then they got drill sergeants who call you every name under the sun along with your mother. And they just tear you down. And then they build you back up until you're a good Marine or soldier. That's how it's done. And that has been done from time immemorial. And now they're practicing these same psychological techniques on masses of people. So the first thing you have to do to get somebody's unqualified cooperation is you have to traumatize them. We were traumatized on 9-11. And in the wake of that, while we were all still numb, fearful, not really thinking straight, boom, we get Patriot Act, Homeland Security, boom, they run it all right through there. Now, if anthrax, you don't hear much about anthrax anymore, do you? We had people killed in these anthrax attacks. Why do you not hear about the anthrax? It because it did not track back to Al-Qaeda or Osama bin Laden. It was weapons grade anthrax only available from the U.S. military. This is a military black ops, psyops, however you want to, it was an operation. Okay? And, uh, yeah. Definition. Psychological operations. Yeah. It was heading towards Washington. Following the script of the Nazis burning the Reichstag as an event and Tom Clancy's supposedly fictional crashing the jetliner into a joint session of Congress, we had both flags flying over the Capitol building indicating both the House and Senate were in session on that Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And whatever blew it out of the sky didn't allow it to finish its mission. Can we speculate a little bit and think that they were following the script as they always like to do and they were actually going to follow through on a coup d'etat. And Cheney and his coup plotters were frustrated that time, and they may have an agenda to have the other shoe drop, which could happen 
just before the election. Apparently what happened there, and I have good information that there was a, a person who was overhearing the last radio signals from Flight 73. The next to last radio transmission was, we have control of the aircraft. And this was not from the hijackers. So apparently what happened was the old let's roll story was probably true. The passengers and the crew now having gotten word through the uh, backseat telephones, that cell phone thing is a whole different issue. Somebody with more technical expertise than myself is going to have to deal with that. But I, what I do know is just about two weeks ago, there was a big press release put out by a certain company that was in t working with one of the big telecommunications firms that said, we have just now developed a chip that we feel like will allow people to make cell phone calls from high-flying aircraft, okay? And from what I understand from people who understand cell phone technology is it's damn difficult, if not impossible, to make a cell phone from a moving jet because number one, by the time the signal connects with a tower, you're past it and it's lost the signal. The other thing is, to, even to make that happen, you have to be at altitudes below uh, six or 8,000 feet. Okay, so these jets that travel at uh, 25, 30, 35,000 feet, you simply can't do it. Now they do have the radio telephones on the back of the seats that some of you are probably familiar with, but you have to use your credit card. But some of these were used, okay? There's a big article in the New Reader's Digest from the widow of, of a uh, Jeremy, some weird last name, Zykes or something like that. And uh, he actually called her on this telephone, and that's some of the best information we may have about Flight 93. When he called, he said, we've been hijacked, and he said they herded us all to the back of the plane. He said, oddly enough, they haven't left a guard. So he was able to just get a telephone call home and say, hey, you know. His wife tells him about the buildings, uh, the planes that have flown into the North and South Tower, and he spreads the word. They knew now not to sit tight because, and wait for them to land safely. He also said that they were told the plane is hijacked, remain calm, we'll land you safely, and we have a bomb on board. They also got a transmission, one of the last transmissions before the final transmissions from the cockpit before it went quiet, and they could hear the sounds of a scuffle and they could hear one of the hijackers say, we have a bomb on board. So now we have every reason to believe because they said that there was a bomb on board. Now, you're right. It turns, it's heading back towards Washington. Of course, it didn't make it, so we'll never know for sure what the target was. I might point out that between the plane crash and between Washington was Camp David. There might have been something going on at Camp David. That may have been a target too, but we'll never know. The point is, is that the next to last transmission they heard was, we have control of the air aircraft. And this came from one of the flight crew. Apparently they did rushed the hijackers, there was a big struggle, they regained control of the aircraft. The next last transmission said, we've been hit by something. Now that does not necessarily mean that a missile or a gunfire or anything else hit the craft because if you're in your car driving along and all of a sudden, bam, you know, you'd say, I've been hit by something. Could be a bomb in the back seat, could be, you know, could be anything. But something happened to that craft and, and as he pointed out, it left an eight mile debris trail. Now I'm an award winning aviation aerospace rider and I guarantee you if a plane flies into the ground, all the wreckage is right there along with the deep crater. This is not what we find. We find an eight mile debris trail and very little crater and that one of the jet engines, huge, big, heavy things was like a thousand yards away. This thing was coming apart in midair. Now early on, my suspicion was that it had been shot down. And I think it was, my suspicion was it was shot down to prevent the crew and the passengers from landing safely and revealing that they couldn't control the aircraft because of Global Hawk electronic technology. But I now know through a friend of mine who has an aviation magazine that they have interviewed the pilot of the F-16 that was in the area. He confirms that he was on war game training exercises. He had no missiles and he only had training ammunition. In other words, he couldn't have shot that plane down even if he had wanted to, all right? In fact, he said in the interview that he was contemplating chemicizing his F-16 into the plane if, if it looked like it was heading towards the capital or something, you know, to try to stop it. Now, that's a heck of a decision, you know, to give up your life to stop somebody. He said, but he didn't have to make the decision because the plane dropped from the sky suddenly. 
And then we also have a commercial pilot in the area who they had been radioing and saying, you, you know, no fly, you got to land. And he said, okay, I'm trying to land. And they said, can you see flight 93? And he looked where he knew the flight was and he said he saw black smoke in the air. Black smoke. Okay, in other words, something happened to that plane in midair. So if it was not shot down, then that leaves the other conclusion that there was a bomb on board and that they triggered it, either the hijackers or someone who could have triggered it remotely. Shouldn't they now have a procedure for appointing members of Congress if more than 100 of them are suddenly killed? Yes. But then they've always had that. Let me make mention of this. Y'all remember the little news items that, uh, that the, the little known election committee that the administration had set up had queried the Justice Department about uh, what are the procedures to postpone or cancel the elections in the event of a, that, new, that news item was not issued as a press release. That news item leaked out. And I don't think it was supposed to leak out. But the, Bush, but the Bush administration spin machine immediately went into operation and they triggered some of their buddies in Congress and they all went, well, yeah, yeah, but it's only, it's only natural to try to come up with a contingency plan. Well, let me tell you, this is really scary if you really got, stop and look at the details of all this. Because the Constitution and all the various state constitutions clearly delineate the procedure if Congress is wiped out or their congressman is no longer there. We have this. So if it's a question of postponing, those procedures are already there. What they were actually looking for was how do we negate the state, legis the state constitutions and cancel elections. And that's what they didn't want clearly brought out. And so the spin went in, well, yeah, we're just looking at, at postponing or canceling if there's a big terrorist attack. And everybody went, well, that makes sense. And that thing just kind of went under the radar. Yes. Flight 93 and the cell phones and the earphones and all that kind of stuff. Uh, my degree is in electrical engineering, so I have some authority on the subject. Uh, and Jim's totally right uh, that the, about the cell phones and the altitude and all that kind of stuff. Uh, cell phones are a function of altitude and speed and, uh, in an airplane, and it's very difficult to make calls, uh, particularly reliably. And some of these calls apparently went on for a while, so the reliability issue is a factor. So chances are some, most, possibly all the cell phone calls are faked. Okay, if we accept that possibility, mm -hmm. then we can also consider the possibility all the air phone calls were faked, mm -hmm. which means the, the what Jim's saying may or may not be true, whether or not, depending on whether or not those air phone calls were faked. If they were in fact faked, uh, the whole let's roll thing may not be true. It may be a contingency plan. Mm -hmm. And what I was uh, realizing the other night, and Jim could probably speak more to this, is that when operations like 9-11 are designed, um, there's all kinds of strings of contingencies. Well, if this happens, then we'll do this, and if this doesn't happen, we'll do this. And so what do we have? We have four planes. They didn't know any of them would get anywhere. You know, this was a one-shot deal, right? And yeah, at by least the way, four planes. Yeah, I was right. going to say, actually, there could have been as many as eight. There could have been there five or six There were some, or some or apparently, that had mechanical trouble, didn't get off on time, some that were running so late that they got caught on the no-fly ban. And uh, I heard from some people that work for American Airlines that the rumors going around within American was that there was as many as eight planes targeted that morning. Right, and, and at least five. I've, I've heard of one that pretty solidly looked like it could have been. Um, so that's sort of, sort of proving the point, the contingency thing. You have multiple options, multiple possibilities, and every option and possibility, there's a contingency plan. So, okay, the first building, first plane hit the first building. Great. All the contingencies that would, you know, if that didn't happen, go away. Now you have a new set. And then the second one worked. Okay, now you've basically accomplished your goal. You've had both planes hit both towers, um, and so the contingencies narrow down at that point. Um, flight 77 and Flight 93 both had a kind of an odd anomaly about them compared to the ter first two flights, and that is they went way the hell out of their way. That may have been a mistake. That may not have been intentional. I personally think it may, it's likely was not intended because the first two planes made pretty much beelines for New York. I mean, they, they didn't really go too far out of their way before they turned and went to, straight to New York. The other two planes went many hundreds of miles yeah. out of their way. Yeah, yeah, this yeah. 93 went all the way to Cleveland, for God's sake. That was probably a mistake. So, again, contingencies kick in. And when, when 77 um, 
well, 77 is another whole story, but 93 got all the way to Cleveland before it turned around. Um, was that part of a contingency? You know, did it, would, have, would it have turned sooner had the other two operations not been successful, possibly? Um, now that it's on the way back, was the let's roll thing a completely designed scenario that was a contingency that says, okay, if the first three work, let's make the fourth one a hero story so that we can put this thing out where the citizens will go, wow, look at, we, you know, we took care of one of them. We left rolled these guys. And we've got this big hero story we can throw out as a smoke screen and, uh, you know, and that sort of thing. So it is conceivable, it is possible that all, all the, um, all the f calls were faked. We know for a fact that there's the technology to do it. You can record a person's voice, and then you can have that voice that's recorded say anything. Mm -hmm. that's, that's proven technology. So it's possible that every single call was fake. Now, the research that would help prove this that I haven't seen and I'm hoping somebody would do is find out when each and every passenger on each and every plane of the four bought their ticket. Did they buy it at the last minute? Did they buy it days or weeks in the head? Because if you got to get a voice recording in order to fake their calls, uh, you got to get that ahead of time somehow, probably. And therefore, well, well the most the most notable one was Barbara Olson. Okay, which is a whole who, lot of questions there, right? A lot right? of questions there because her husband works for the Bushies, okay, she's and totally she's a and she's a news broadcaster, so they got her voice everywhere. Right, and and there's a lot of questions around that one alone. And he wasn't just a friend; he was their top. Huh? He's yeah, very in on with them. He's not just some associate. He's yeah. totally in with it. So my question on that one is, does anybody know about their relationship? Was he wanting to divorce her? Or, you know, is she really now spending her life in hiding? I mean, there's a lot of possibilities and questions there. But the point is, as you look at things like Flight 93, you have to have it in the greater context of contingencies. That 93 didn't necessarily go where it was supposed to go. It may have been the whole let's, let's roll thing may have been way down the uh, contingency list of if everything else goes well, let's make that one into the hero story so that uh, we, we can throw that out as a cover story. Well, is, is there any more information that the capital was the intended target for 93? Well, it seems likely it could have been either the Senate or the, uh, the Capitol building or the White House mm -hmm. for possibly 93. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is quite possible. Of course, that's something that didn't happen, so you'll never prove it. Huh? Yeah. Right. Yes. Question: In your re in either of your research, have you found any information about military radar, which is generally more, has some more sophisticated radar than the FAA radar? And I know the you know the NORAD and the and the Aerospace Command watch everything. In, in the atmosphere. From satellites as well. They watch See, the satellites. FAA has a problem because if you get below a certain level, they you're off their radar screen, but those satellites, they got you right. the whole time. So is there anything, since the FAA has inferior radar, and there was a, a problem in some of the, the discussion yesterday they were raising about, since the, the transponders were turned off, they had difficulty lo locating the altitude. So my question comes, uh, is, was the... With all these exercises, was that screwing up the military in, in the sense, it, well, obviously it would be, but in terms of their overall radar with the first, you know, the Aerospace Command, which is watching everything in the air, high altitude, low altitude, that's one question. And the second question is, have either of you talked to or run across research about the electronics of the new jets, with the 757s, 767s, that can be uh, piloted remotely. Absolutely. That uh, let, let me take two of the, in sequence there. First off, both of those are very good questions. I can answer the second one uh, pretty well. The first one is a very, very good question, but the problem is the only way you could get that answer is by getting straight talk from top military brass. And what I can tell you without any fear of contradiction is we haven't gotten straight talk from the military authorities. In fact, the 9-11 Commission gives a timetable and a time frame for all of these hijackings and all of this terror attacks that is at variance with their own sworn testimony. And the military is at variance with the FAA. And it all seems like they're trying to throw off the blame onto the FAA. Okay? So that's a very, that's a hole big enough to drive a truck through in the 9-11 Commission report. And unfortunately, see, we don't have the answers because just like in the case of the Kennedy assassination, here it is 41 years later almost, and there has yet to be an honest investigation of the Kennedy assassination. 
And my fear is and concern is that it'll be another 40 years and we'll be wrangling over, uh, you know, 40 years from now, there'll be young people arguing over the, uh, the, uh, the, the temperature it takes to melt structural steel and, and they'll just get lost in the minutia and we'll never figure out exactly what's going on. Now to your second question, Global Hawk Technology. In summer of 2001, a Boeing 737 took off from Andrews, uh, Edwards Air Force Base, California, flew to Australia, flew 12 missions, and then flew back and landed at Edwards Air Force Base, and there wasn't anybody on board. It was a drone aircraft, one of the most successful uh, tests of Global Hawk technology. In Afghanistan, I believe in Iraq too, it was Global Hawk uh, drones that first flew the missions going in and photographing the target areas to be followed by our fighters and bombers that were going in there. Now, I know for certain that this technology has existed since perhaps the early uh, late uh, 70s and certainly by the early 80s. Not long after 9-11, I was contacted by a producer friend of mine who told me that about 1984, uh, his production company had a deal with uh, TWA Airlines and uh, they, it was a swap out. They flew them to some jobs and in turn they did a video documentary type thing about TWA. And he interviewed some of the pilots of their big jumbo jets. Now these are, as far as I know, this is confined to Boeing. Boeing 737s, 757s, 767s, okay? The planes that were used. And uh, the very planes that are involved. These are fly-by-wire aircraft now, okay, which means that they're all uh, computer um, and digital technologies. This, this pilot of, a, of Boeing uh, TWA and a Boeing widebody back in the mid-80s on this documentary said, well, my job is now redundant. He said, I'm only here in case the system fails. He's, and then also in early 2000, the head of British Airways announced the end of the era of hijacking because he said, now with new technology, we can electronically capture the control system of the plane. Basically, this is real simplistic, but basically it's like you're familiar with a CB radio. If you got a CB radio and you're trying to talk to somebody and somebody with a stronger signal, it's called, they step on you, okay? They override your signal and you can't talk to your friend because all you can hear is the guy that's broadcasting on the stronger signal. It's basically that, that type of thing. This is, this is in place. Even George W. Bush, a few days after 9-11, was interviewed in, in the New York Times and mentioned the fact that we have new technology that would be able to prevent hijackings because it can take over the airline and uh, it can land the plane safety regardless of what the hijackers or the flight crew want to do. And of course, he phrased it in such a way it sounded like it was in the future, but this is a technology that has existed since the 70s. Been around for years. Just to follow up on that. Just I, to follow up. Okay, can, I, can I just add something more to it? Um, the, yeah, this, this technology has been around since at least the 60s, as far as I know. Um, and those planes, yeah, are automatic, are, are equipped that way. And part of the reason we know that is that Andreas von Bülow of Germany, the minister mm -hmm. that's come out about 9-11, talked about Lufthansa and how when their pilots were taking, uh, were, they were getting these new planes with this remote control technology, and they didn't like it. They didn't want somebody to be able to take over their plane, so they demanded it be taken out. That's right. So there we was know a big those planes were Germany equipped that about way. That technology. And of course, the ultimate irony, it was meant to prevent hijackings. Yes. So there's that. And also on the radar thing, um, again, as an engineer, yeah, we don't know officially from the military, but I can tell you as an engineer that, that for instance, Flight 77 being lost on radar all the way from Ohio to D.C., that's just not possible. The radar that the military has and the satellite and all that kind of stuff is so sophisticated, they can read license plates on cars from space. That's right. They can certainly find a damn airliner. That's right. So I'm that's just, just not possible. To follow yeah, just to follow up. So the technology exists. It's existed since the late 80s. So one question comes up right away. Was the, te the technology existed to take control of those aircraft when they were by the, by the authorities when the plane was hijacked? If they, this technology exists, why wasn't it employed on these hijack aircraft to take them over from the hijackers? And then a follow-up part of that is, the scenario comes out real clear. You can have terrorist groups that they're tracking and watching. They're on the planes, okay, doing this thing, and they're the lone gunman, if you will. But they really, the, the, the secret ops people in the government have control of the aircraft, 
So just in case the hijackers either screw up or get, get taken over by the, the, the people on the plane, they can take that plane right on into the world. Let, let me give you an answer from Osama bin Laden himself. In the videotape that the CIA came up with, which is questionable, but nevertheless, a month or two after 9-11, they came up with this tape. And in the tape, Osama bin Laden kind of laughed and said they didn't know they were on a suicide mission. And you couple that with the idea that we, you know, the official story is that these devout Muslims who are told you cannot drink alcohol, you cannot, you know, carouse with women, you cannot do any of this stuff. And we're expected to believe that on the evening before they're pulling off their big strike against the great Satan and knowing with full knowledge they're going to go and meet Allah, okay? And what are they doing? According to the Boston Globe, they're out partying, drinking, smoking, and looking for hookers. Does not sound like fundamental Muslims, sounds like Arab mercenaries, the very people that comprised the Mujahideen and then were recruited by the CIA into the Al-Qaeda network. And again, never lose sight of the fact Al-Qaeda is being run by the Saudis through the Pakistani ISI, their CIA, which was created, funded, and pretty much run by our CIA. And Saudi Arabia, by the way, is very much under the thumb of the CIA because of the oil interest. Yes. So with Flight 93, that's the flight that crashed in Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. Blew up. Why didn't they just use this technology to <coughs> crash it rather than blowing it up in the air? Do you think it just failed? I think, my, now this is sheer conjecture on my part, they could not allow any of those planes to land safely because the crew and the passengers would say, damn, we couldn't control the airplane. And by the way, it got left out of my book, Inside Job, because of various reasons, but I, does everybody know about military remote viewing? Okay. I commissioned a remote viewing study by some very competent remote viewers on 9-11. And just for your information, I'll tell you what they came up with. The, the one that really got me was, was my question that said, who was at the controls of the aircraft that crashed into the World Trade Center? And the answer was, no one. Okay? Then I asked, did George W. Bush have foreknowledge of the attacks? The answer was, no. Mm -hmm. Did George Herbert Walker Bush have foreknowledge of the attacks? Yes. Mm -hmm. Did Dick Cheney have foreknowledge of the attacks? Yes. Did certain members within the Council on Foreign Relations have foreknowledge of the attacks? Yes. Okay, so that gives you a little bit of guidance. Don't take that as absolute ground truth, but you have to, when it, on a big mystery like this, where we're being lied to and when there's so much information flying around, you just take everything you can get and then you try to correlate it. That leads into my other question, because I know a lot was kept out of your original man manuscript, wasn't it? The inside job. Right. Is there any other kind of key points that uh, you'd like to share? Thankfully, with? most of the key stuff is all in there. What uh, what got left out was the whole back end of my original manuscript, which was going to be published by Harper Collins, and they canceled, which gets into the Patriot Act and the uh, Homeland Security. Uh, Homeland Security, here's a little tidbit for you. Who heads Homeland Security? Ridge. Tom Ridge. Does everybody know about Operation Phoenix? Phoenix. Tom Ridge, who is now in charge of protecting the population of the United States, was a member of the Phoenix operation during Vietnam, which killed 65,000 people as part of a civilian population control project. And it's scary because the way Phoenix operated was they would take an anonymous tip and they would come out and arrest you. And then they would beat you and torture you until you either died or gave up the name of somebody else, and then they go grab them and do the same thing. 65,000 people were killed under this pacification program. Now, doesn't that give you the warm and fuzzies about being protected by Tom Bridge and his uh, General Lawler, who, again, is another one of the top-ranking guys in Homeland? He, he, I would have to go back and look that up. He was simply part of all that. General Lawler, again, that's with Homeland Security, was, again, part of that. And see, that gets passed over, and nobody gets talked about that. Mm -hmm. Two questions. Can you explain what remote viewing is? I don't know what that is. And second, okay. well, I'm not sure if you answered my question. I'm saying, why right. didn't they? Why did they blow up the plane in air, risk the eight-mile trail of debris, rather mm -hmm. than if the technology was working, just crash it into the ground? 
why didn't they just do that? Because they set up this other problem with eight mile creek. Right? We so don't know. It could have been anything. Number one, they could have triggered a bomb on board, again, just to knock it out. Two, the hijackers may indeed have brought a bomb on board, and they might have said, we're being overcome, so they triggered the bomb. Okay, I, there's any number of scenarios there. We don't know. And, my, and my, my gripe is, I mean, we could go back to the Kennedy assassination. There's a lot of unanswered questions there, and we don't know because there's never been a truthful investigation. We should know. Um, it, it's absolutely amazing. Remote viewing. We could spend all day here talking about remote viewing. In fact, I've even done remote viewing training. I could train you all to do it, okay? But to answer your question, remote viewing is a technology uh, developed first by the CIA and then used operationally by the United States Army for 25 years under four separate administrations. It is the acquisition of information on people, places, and things by means other than the five senses. To put it more succinctly, it's a psychic ability. All right? And it's interesting because they didn't just start doing this or decide they were going to do this. This was a reaction to the Soviets and to East European nations who had been studying and researching with psychic abilities for many, many years. About 1970, a book came out called Psychic Discoveries Behind the Iron Curtain. I remember it made a brief stir there for a while. And, of course, most people, certainly back then, said, ah, it's BS. You know, they didn't even want to hear about it. And most people in the Pentagon and at Langley felt the same way. But we can't have a psychic gap. <laughs> if the commies are doing this, we got to do this. So they actually put out some money. They've got uh, one of my, who continues to be a friend of mine, Dr. Hal Putoff, uh, who is now in Austin working on Zero Point Energy, okay? He put him and Russell Targ, they put them out here at Stanford Research Institute, and they began to test, 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 test and they found out that it works and I'm here to tell you it works because I don't even believe in it but I've done it and it works. Mm -hmm. I remote viewed an office building and uh, in uh, New Mexico drew a sketch of the building and then drew a floor plan and then went out to New Mexico and I said is this the office and they said no we're in a ranch style home so I thought well that takes care of me I'm not worth anything. But the guy held on to it, and about a year later, I went back, and they had leased a recently built office complex to teach remote viewing, and the guy just smiled at me, handed me my paperback, drove me to this place, and it was exactly as I sketched it, and then he gave me the official floor plan of the building, and it was 100% accurate that I had drawn in my remote viewing session. So in other words, I had remote viewed into the future, okay? And they proved this, okay? They proved this because they would send people out against targets. They would drive around having no idea where they were going until they would stop somewhere and they'd call them and give them a number, a coordinate number representing their target. And then they would remote view the thing, give the information back to SRI, and then they would tell them for immediate feedback, they'd say, okay, go to this location. They'd go there and they'd see what their target had been and it really coordinated extremely well okay this is how they knew it worked what they found out was though is that it got to the point to where the people would go to the target before they gave it to them they already knew it now this gets into all kinds of like I said we could spend hours on this but <clears throat> I'm sure a lot of you even the ones that know about it the big question is how does this work and we don't really know that's the big problem and that's why it hasn't made a bigger waves in the scientific and in the general population because it tends to violate the scientific principle, which is you have a hypothesis and then you test and retest and duplicate, replicate your hypothesis and if it continues to replicate then you've got a law or a, or a fact, okay? Well, they can prove it works, but they don't have a hypothesis. <laughs> they don't know how it works, okay? So it kind of scrambles the whole thing up, so they don't like to deal with it. My particular idea after talking and studying and everything I know about it is that Einstein was correct when he talked about the unified field theory, that the entire universe is one big mass energy field and that we're all part of it. Uh, all matter is nothing but excited energy. This chair appears to be pretty solid, but if you get down to the molecular level, it's just space. There's huge distances between the electrons and the 
and, of the, and the nuclei of the atoms that make up that chair. So actually everything in the universe is nothing but energy. And, we, and the reason we see things as our reality is because that's how we perceive it. Reality is not out there, it's right here. Okay? Now, once you understand that everything's one... <laughs> Yeah, now, you, now once you what understand that everything is a huge energy field. I don't think I have. <laughs> That'd be great. All right, so, so anyway, if, if indeed all this is correct and everything is one huge energy grid, okay, then when you have a thought, that thought is energy. And that thought goes on to the grid. So the only trick then is, do you have the perception to pick it up off the grid? And this is why when you give a, a I'll, give you, I'll give you a classic example. I've got a documentary that's out right now, you can find it on my website, it's called The Secret of Redgate. It's about a little bitty town in Montana, 3,000 people who for the last 50 years has had ongoing UFO experiences, ranging all the way from simple sightings to abductions. And <clears throat> What we did is employ every investigative tool that we could to some of these experiences. We took some of the best ones, we got their conscious recollection of what had happened, then we got them to agree to hypnosis, and we picked up more information through hypnosis, and then we subjected them to a polygraph. Polygraph showed that not one of the people that we, they tested showed any signs of deception. Doesn't mean it's all true, but it means they believe it, okay? Then we had remote viewers look at their experiences and say, what do you see happened here? One of them, for sake of example, was two small children when they were young. One of them consciously remembers this, the other didn't until she underwent hypnosis. When they were small kids, they'd leave their little ranch and they'd go into the woods to meet their little gray friends, okay? And so we subjected their uh, experiences to eight remote viewers. Now the way it works is, is that one person got the targets. We said, we want to know what happened to these two children back in Montana in 1950. That's the target, okay? This person came up with a eight-digit number, 8416231, okay? He's the only one that knows the target. He passed the target number to a monitor who had nothing to go on except the number, who then called the eight viewers and simply gave them the number. They had nothing to go on but this number. But they went through the proper methodology of remote viewing and all eight came back and said essentially, these are two small children who went in the woods and met aliens. Isn't that amazing? But it works, it really works. And the government knows it works because they used it for 25 years and they're still using it, although they will deny it. And when they say there is no one a task in the government to do remote viewing, they're telling you the truth because what they've done is all the guys that were in the military unit are now out of the military and they are civilian contractors and, they go, and the government contracts with them to do the remote viewing and that way they can legitimately avoid all of the outcry from the fundamentalist and everybody else that said, well, oh, you're dealing with the devil or whatever, okay? So they can say, we're not doing it. And technically they're not, but under the table they are. Got a, a word issue for me since so much of what we're talking about is what we perceive inside. When we use the word government, to me it, it conjures up this whole group. Right. Whether we're not talking about the government, we're talking no. about elements that are yeah. using and exploiting the government. And really, if we start talking about it with some differentiation, I think we're going to make it much more empowering for people. That's very, very good. And let me, I'll call, I, I'll give Ken a chance to say what his definition is. When I'm talking about the government, I'm not talking about your postman. And I'm not talking about low-level FBI agents, and I'm not talking about all the statisticians, statisticians and people who work for the government. I'm talking about actually uh, what I should say is the shadow government, okay? The, the people who are on the inside, and some of them who are not even officially in government, but the people who truly call the shots in this country. Ken, do you have any better explanation? That, that's that's it, about it? Okay. Yeah, shadow government is a very small percentage. They have tens of billions of dollars to play with. Yeah. And they do all kinds of nasty stuff all the time that nobody knows about it because it's secret. I know. Except, and it, it, what's amazing is that after 9-11, the, the term shadow government actually got 
out into the mass media, you know, they actually admitted they had something like that. So, uh, so would you say that there was a shadow government operating separately from Bill Clinton? Mm -hmm. oh, of course. Yes. The president is usually, very often, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan, George W. Bush, they are really, they're just puppets of the shadow government. George Herbert Walker Bush now, he was one of the only modern presidents we've had who was really a player. And that's why they couldn't let him have a second term. He, it was getting a little bit dicey. They were starting to uncover a lot of this stuff. Go ahead. Sorry, we have to drive to Los Angeles. So yeah. I, I loved your thing, and we didn't mean to stay this long. In fact, we meant to leave today, but I have to hear your little, your little thing. But I did have, can I ask two questions? Sure, sure. Okay, one was, you said that they didn't, that we had to attack Baghdad because they didn't want us to know our true roots. And oh, I wondered who they was. You're you know getting into this whole thing. It, it, I'm sorry, it, it, would, it, it would take too long to explain. I'll try to give you 25 words or less. There, there was, there, I've got the news clippings. There it was, a, a quote, amazing new archaeological discoveries in Iraq made by German and French archaeological teams beginning in 1999 and going all the way up to early 2003. And they were all, this was all done under the sanction of Saddam Hussein. Now, where do you think they would take these tablets, scrolls, artifacts, all kinds of things? They, they took them to the Iraqi National Museum. And are they, do they take them into a museum and then put them on display? No, they take them to the basement where they catalog them, warehouse them, clean them up, and prepare them for exhibition, okay? For some reason, and I could explain that, but it'd take too long, we had to get our hands on these artifacts. So we made a beeline for Baghdad. This is why we're still having problem in Iraq because against all military tactics, we failed to pacify the countryside. We just made a beeline for Baghdad, and although we had Marines guarding the oil ministry, we allowed the Iraqi museum to be looted, okay? But as Colonel Bagdanos, who was tasked by General Tommy Franks to investigate the Iraqi National Museum looting said, he wrote in February issue this year, Archaeological Magazine, he said the inside job was in the basement. And uh, out of some 10,000 objects taken out of the basement, they've only recovered 50 or so, okay? Now, they found glass cutters that were not commercially available in Iraq. They buy, the people who, now they, I'm sure they hired a bunch of people, crowds to go in there as a cover and they were looting, crashing stuff, grabbing this and that, and they've recovered most of that stuff, okay? Meanwhile, by the way, I do need to say this. Thousands of Iraqis were around the museum shouting, don't do this, it's our national heritage. So this was not, this was just a handful of people with a hardcore of special operatives. And they had special equipment, they bypassed expensive looking fakes, they had keys to the vault, some of the guards were suspiciously mission, missing. This was an operation. And they went in there and they got the stuff out of the basement, the new discoveries. And it has to do with the deepest, darkest secrets that we have in this country today, which has to do with the manipulation of energy at the atomic and subatomic level, which leads us into the area of zero-point energy, limitless free energy, faster than light travel, longevity, dimensional and time travel. And these are secrets that have been held, held and, and written down and passed along since our prehistory in Mesopotamia. And if you want to know more about that, read Rule by Secrecy. That'll give you an idea of what I'm, what you, what I'm talking about, okay? I think I heard you ask who they was, though, right? Yeah, you said they didn't want us to know our roots. Are you talking about our... Well, let's just put it this way. The, the, the small handful of wealthy elite that are attempting to run the world, okay? I call them the New World Order boys. I could... The Enlo versus the Anti-Vax and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And their, and their more recent pro, uh, offspring, the Rockefellers, the Rothschilds, the, you know, these bloodline families that come down. Yeah. Can you talk a little about Omaha? Thank you for being here. Headquarters of uh, Strategic Air Command on 9-11, where a number of Republican <coughs> fundraisers were told to go to get out of New York City, and a major set of people gathered in Omaha? Well, if you'll read my book, you'll find that, number one, the warnings of foreknowledge were everywhere. China, Russia, the Taliban in Afghanistan, all of them were giving us warnings. Even the 9-11 Commission has a whole chapter entitled The 
warning system was flashing red. They, they acknowledged that they, all these warnings were there. In fact, this is really a hoot. There are two broad views of history. Accidental, shit happens, and conspiracy. If it happened, somebody planned it that way, okay? Needless to say, I'm of the conspiratorial view because that's what history shows us. Yes, there are, in fact, my line is this. If it's not an act of God, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> now, it sounds pretty funny, but if you'll think about it, it's true. Accidents do happen. Ships sink, planes crash. We all have had auto accidents. You didn't mean to. So there are acts of God. But in world events, if there's a war, <laughs> you know, yeah, or if, uh, if uh, policies are made or our legislation is passed, that's not an accident. Somebody wanted that, okay? And so, in fact, here is the best example I can give you, not only of the proof of conspiracy, but of the greatest conspiracy going on in the world today. Even as we sit here this afternoon, you all know full well, we don't like to think about this, but we know that across this planet, there are literally millions of people a lot of them children who are starving to death. We know this. Why is this? Well, once you get past all the rationales about, well, we don't have the money, we don't have the transportation, we don't, you know, lines of uh, transportation, blah, 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 blah. The ball faced fact is because none of us want that, do you? I don't want one child to starve anywhere. You don't, do you? You don't. Nobody does. Why is it this way? Because we also know that we have the technology on this planet today to feed and clothe and house and give some minimal health care to every single person on the planet. So why is it not being done? Once you get past the rhetoric and the rationales, it's because somewhere somebody doesn't want that. Now that's the biggest conspiracy going on and it's the proof of a conspiracy. If nobody, I know in this room we're all in the same accord, if everybody in the world felt the same way we do, we don't want that, it wouldn't be that way, would it? So that's the proof not only of conspiracy, but the biggest one going on today. <clears throat> and that leads us to ask her question, <coughs> who are they? Who is it that doesn't want every child on this planet given some minimum food, clothing, shelter? Might want to start grappling with that because number one, until we understand the cause of the problem, we'll never have a solution. Any other questions? Oh, I think we're going to take a little break. Let's break or can we do that? Okay. I know it's time for me. I gotta get something wet. <laughs> right there. I'll get. anybody anybody got a cold beer? <laughs>